can't always get what you want, the old Rolling Stones song went. But if you try sometimes, well, you might find you get what you need. I don't usually draw a lot of spiritual foundation from pop culture, and certainly not from rock music, but it has its value. Pop music introduced me through Blood, Sweat, and Tears' popular God Bless the Child. God Bless the Child. Uh, to the immensely more uh, significant and haunting original by Billie Holiday. Them that's got shall get, them that's not shall lose. So the Bible said, and it still is new, Mama may have and Papa may have, but God bless the child that's got his own, that's got his own. In her autobiography, Holiday tells that she got the idea for the song after approaching her mother for a loan, when her mother, who had often benefited from Holiday's financial assistance, refused. Holiday shouted back, "God bless the child that's got his own." Much has been written about the song, uh, which uh, and recorded by dozens of vocalists over the years, and which one columnist has said became an anthem of self-determination for many African Americans. It is at once mournful and uplifting. It's an unfair world. Take care of yourself. God bless the child that's got his own. I've never been a fan of uh, eschatology. You know, it doesn't seem to me to be much of an exercise of our agency as human beings if we live life as if the second coming is just around the corner. For a while, I wondered if uh, it might have all been a misunderstanding. Wasn't the resurrection really the second coming that they were talking about? And for a while, I idly convinced myself that this stuff about the second coming was all later ideas and not actually, except for the book of Revelation, which I, like Martin Luther, which I, like Martin Luther, was skeptical about. But then I finally sat down and looked, and Yes, the second coming has a pretty solid basis in scripture. So I've come to terms with the whole idea and also come to terms to understand that it does not limit us. Recognizing the power of the choice that you have and using that power is a fundamental responsibility of the living. Viktor Frankl the Australian psychiatrist and survivor of three years in Auschwitz, Dachau, and other concentration camps, detailed firsthand how this choice can be exercised, even in the most desperate circumstances imaginable. In his autobiographical psychology book, Man's Search for Meaning, a real page turner that I recommend to everyone, he writes, to be sure, a human being is a finite thing, and his freedom is restricted. It is not freedom from conditions, but it is freedom to take a stand toward the conditions. He continues, as a professor in two fields, neurology and psychiatry, I am fully aware of the extent to which man is subject to biological psychological and sociological conditions. But in addition to being a professor in two fields, I am a survivor of four camps, concentration camps, that is. And as such, I bear witness to the unexpected extent to which a human is capable of defying and braving even the worst conditions conceivable. Frankl's credo is that a person is never so reduced that he doesn't have the slightest residue of freedom. He wrote, and here I am eschewing inclusive language edited in editing in deference to the original text. So bear with me. In the concentration camps, for example, 
in this living laboratory and on this testing ground, we watched and witnessed some of our comrades behave like swine while others behaved like saints. Man has both potentialities within himself. Which one is actualized depends on decisions, but not on conditions." End of quote. So much of the human condition is determined by circumstances we did not create, but not all. Frankl's premise in his book is that finding meaning in your life is understanding that the decisions you make matter. They make a difference. Today is the fifth Sunday of Easter. A week from next Thursday is Ascension, Ascension Day when Jesus was sucked up into heaven. And uh, three weeks from today is Pentecost, uh, the end of, end of Eastertide, celebrating the gift of the Holy Spirit. In this season, We've seen, we've hoped, we've mourned, we've rejoiced at the resurrection, we've, re we've reunited with him in Galilee, and we saw him depart. And now what? Well, Jesus tells us. In our gospel reading from John 15, we hear that Jesus is the vine and we are the branches, and God is the vine grower. Jesus said, those who abide in me and I in them, bear me. Oh, and there's also the not so feel good part about pruning. Those that bear no fruit are cut off and discarded, thrown into the fire. Those that bear fruit are pruned to make them bear more fruit. It's an interesting footnote that cleansing and prune, pruning derive from the same root in the Greek text. We are cleansed and pruned, cleansed of our original and corporate sin by the sacrifice of the lamb and pruned that we may bear more fruit. The pruning is bound to hurt a bit and the fruit we are expected to bear this gospel passage immediately precedes Jesus' familiar commandment in verse 12 of John. Um, and it says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. The message is picked up and elaborated in the epistle of John. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not, know God, love does not know God, for God is love. Now what? There's your answer. Love your brothers and sisters, not just siblings, our fellow humans. That's, that's not so easy to do in the age we are in today. There is a whole industry of resentment. People making a living, filling our social media and email inboxes with breathless outrage about this or that, reaping contributions from the wrath they motivate. Large dollar donors get more personalized for this, but the game is the same. Reaping revenue animated by animus. And this is not really new. Remember the earnest young paid volunteers with clipboards knocking on your door in the 1880s or 90s? The technology has certainly changed the scale and business model of the industry with messages honed for target audiences delivered by precision communications. It is just plain human nature, animal nature, that we are more easily and certainly more quickly motivated by fear, by mistrust, by grievance, than by respect, humility, and kindness. 
There is, of course, plenty to be outraged about, and plenty of right to be doing, and plenty of wrong to be opposing. How do we do it? The answer is love. Now, isn't that just precious? All right, so yes, the answer is love, but let's take a closer look. The Greek language, you know, which of course the New Testament was originally written in, distinguishes different kinds of loves. Storga, the natural love as a parent for a child. Philia, brotherly love among friends, family, and community. Eros, romantic love, you know, all mixed up with the passions of the flesh. And agape, the spiritual love of God. Thomas Aquinas further explains agape as to will the good of another. But in English, we group them all under the word love, and it causes us all kinds of mischief. In these passages of scripture, the word is agape, the love that comes to us and flows through us from God, from the vine to the branch to the fruit. And it is agape in 1 Corinthians 13.13, 13, where Paul writes, and now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. Jesus shows us how to draw on the love of God for the motivation we need to do good in this world, and especially for the motivation to oppose what is wrong without the wrong making us its captive. Without returning scorn for scorn, doubt for doubt, hate for hate. How does this work? I did a little experiment years ago. I, I was working in the radiology department, uh, an assistant professor with some hospital responsibilities that required regular interaction with the department chairman. The chairman's secretary, Bonnie, not her real name, uh, controlled the chairman's schedule. And she was scowling and imperious in her exercise of her power. She was impossible to like. But then I set a project for myself. I am going to love Bonnie. It took a long time. I began to see that she was an unhappy person. And without knowing or learning anything about her life, I began to sympathize and care for her well-being. Of course, our working relationship improved as a result. We didn't become friends. I just cared about her with love. It was a voluntary act. John writes, no one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. By abiding in him and he in us, we bear much fruit, and that fruit is love and charity to others. Through the hope, the suffering, the triumph of Jesus Christ, which we celebrate this and every Easter, we are, if we choose to accept it, freed from the sin of our nature and our past, we are recipients of the extravagant gift of God's love, agape, and what we do with it is up to us. God bless the child that's got its own. You got what you need.